My name is Thomas Stegman. I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, and uh, when they allow me, or when I allow myself, I teach New Testament here at, at the school as well. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome you uh, to this very uh, important, significant event for the life of the school. Uh, the School of Theology and Ministry is celebrating our 10th anniversary this year, and we're doing so in a number of ways, including celebrating uh, the way the Word of God has been valued, taught, and written about, not just in, the, in uh, the last 10 years, but really for a lengthy period. I'll say more about that at the uh, event tonight. Uh, we're also using this opportunity as, or this occasion as an opportunity to launch the Paulus Biblical Commentary. You'll hear more about that tonight as well. Uh, but there's an opportunity to uh, uh, look at and, uh, and purchase a copy if you're interested. Uh, the sessions this afternoon and tomorrow morning are featuring co-editors of the uh, PBC. Uh, they'll be presenting on uh, specific topics. And then I've also invited some younger members of the STM faculty, particularly in the area of Bible, to serve as initial responders to the presentations. Uh, this event is sponsored by the School of Theology and Ministry in conjunction with our friends at Paulus Press. It's also made possible uh, by the generosity of Christine Donovan, an STN, uh, STM alumna who is in our midst, and we thank you, Christina. Uh, one last thing I want to say before introducing our speaker, our, our initial presenter, is all of the sessions are being videotaped and will be posted online at bc.edu slash encore by December 15th. So I ask you to keep this in mind uh, because we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions, wait for a microphone to be brought to you, and also be cognizant of the fact that since this will be online and available for millions of people to see, you want your best question uh, to be put forward. Okay. <laughs> so let's move to our first uh, session, which is the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. And our presenter for this session is Father Richard Clifford, a native of Lewiston, Maine. He is STM Professor Emeritus of Old Testament. A graduate of Boston College, uh, A, B, and M, A, which makes him a double eagle, and actually a triple eagle because of his licentiate from Weston Jesuit School of Theology. He holds a PhD from Harvard. Father Clifford has taught biblical studies at Weston Jesuit School of Theology from 1970 to 2008. He served as the last president of Weston Jesuit School of Theology and was the founding dean of the School of Theology and Ministry. Uh, he served the first two years of the school, 2008 to 2010. Uh, he was general editor of the Catholic Biblical Quarterly and is former president of the Catholic Biblical Association. He continues to teach and lecture in scholarly circles and is also active in adult education in New England diocese. And even though Dick is emeritus, he's basically a full-time teaching and in his 49th year of doing so. And I have the pleasure of team teaching a course with him uh, this semester. With numerous essays and commentaries to his credit and monographs as well, Father Clifford served as the co-editor of the Paulist Biblical Commentary, for which he also wrote the commentaries on Genesis, the prophet Nahum, and the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, he also co-authored with me the article on the Christian Bible, uh, which will be in part uh, the basis of this presentation. I will also uh, introduce real briefly our respondent, Father Michael Simone, who's Assistant Professor of Old Testament at the STM and the contributor of the commentary on Judges. Without further ado, Father Richard Clifford. Thank you, Father Stegman. I'm very happy to be here to celebrate on this very happy occasion of both the publication of the commentary and also the anniversary of our school. <clears throat> My topic is the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. Jesus and his early followers would have been puzzled by the title of this paper, the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. They knew neither an Old Testament nor a Christian Bible, and the adjective Christian was unknown in Jesus' a lifetime. You might ask why I chose this then for a topic. Jesus and his early followers, like all Jews of the time, knew only the writings, the hagraphai, as the New Testament calls it, more or less our, old, our own Old Testament. 
In fact, the Bible as we know it today took shape only in the couple of centuries prior to the uh, Jesus. Uh, to, uh, and uh, prior to that time, we can say that Jews had authoritative traditions, but not the kind of conception of the book that we take for granted. But we live in the 21st century, not the first, and too many Christians today regard those, the writings, the high graphi, the Old Testament, as mere background to the new, not as God's word to them, still less as the pedagogue that taught Christians that their own writings were scripture too. I use the term in this talk, Old Testament, but I also could use Hebrew Bible or uh, Tanakh, the Jewish, often the Jewish term. But old, I mean a venerable, elder, and generative, so I can use the Old Testament. How, the first question is, how did, the old, how did the Christian Bible become, in the eyes of many, two books instead of one? The roots of this neglect of the Old Testament go back to the second century when the Christian heretic Martian vigorously propagated his view that the Christian gospel was all about love to the exclusion of what he called law, his term for the ancient scriptures. Characterizing the Old Testament God as tyrannical, cruel, and utterly different from Jesus, Martian dismissed even the New Testament, accepting only the letters, 10 letters of Paul, who he said alone understood the contrast between law and grace, and, he, and a scaled-down version uh, of the Gospel of Luke. F fortunately, Martian's views did not prevail, but they didn't die out either, completely. They live on among Christians who pit an alleged harsh Old Testament creator God against an alleged merciful Jesus. In the last three centuries, the, situ the split has become wider. Hans Frey's aptly titled 1973 book, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative, a study in 18th and 19th century hermeneutics, showed how up to the 18th century, people read the Bible as realistic narrative of events from the creation of the world to the second coming of Christ with readers able to fit themselves into that single story. Such an assumption made possible a figural interpretation of the Bible for biblical characters and events either echoed or prefigured characters and events in an uninterrupted story unfolding in both testaments. In the 18th century, however, a shift occurred, especially among German and English thinkers, according to Frey, who, adopting critical approaches that were current at the time, read the Bible differently. The location of authority shifted. People's own experience defined what was real for them. <clears throat> they interpreted the Bible by referring it to their own world, thus reversing the direction of the reading of past centuries. To overgeneralize a bit, not finding that the Bible's basic narrative described their reality, <clears throat> they found meaning in the Bible either in the historical events behind the biblical account or in the eternal truths derived from the Bible. The turn from realistic narrative from the creation of the world to the second coming of Christ gave rise to a new kind of biblical theology in the 18th century Protestantism particularly. Since many re readers no longer accepted a single realistic narrative to unify the Bible, they systematized biblical teaching in the categories of dogmatic theology. A professor at the University of Altdorf in Germany, whose name is Johann Philipp Gabler, is credited with introducing this new kind of biblical theology in his inaugural lecture in 1787. In relating the, the biblical and dogmatic theology, Gabler was influenced by his theory of the history of ideas. The earlier the period, he argued, the more primitive the idea. The later the time period, the more rational the idea was. As Ben Olenberger, who has written about these matters, observes, one possible implication of Gabler's proposal is that the Old Testament occupies a lower rung on the ladder of reason than does the New. After all, it is from an earlier era. The gap between the, new te the Testaments grew wider as a result and became even wider by the modern separation of New and Old Testament in university graduate programs. So you might ask, how can we gain a, regain a sense of the one Bible and the Testament says, intimately related. The factors that isolated the Old Testament from the New ran directly counter to the Bible's own literary character. For the Bible, like other Middle Eastern literature, constantly refers to ancestral traditions and develops them. In a word, biblical literature moves backward and forward. Recording this backward and forward rhythm, I call cross-referencing in preference to the more traditional but less revealing term, typology, 
in which the type is the Old Testament event or character and the antitype, the New Testament recurrence. Cross-referencing not only connects the New Testament to the Old, but I think sometimes forgotten, it also occurs often within each testament. A New Testament example is in the Acts of the Apostles, where, the apost where Jesus' uh, readings, uh, words and healings replicate, are replicated in the Acts of the Apostles. It's a narrative way of expressing the Spirit's continuing work in the community. Another, an Old Testament example with, of cross-referencing within the Testament occurs in the, art, in the artful reuse of the Hebrew word for ark, which is teva. The word occurs in only two places in the Old Testament. In Genesis 6 to 8, to refer to the boat that saved Noah and his family from the universal flood, and in the second chapter of the book of Exodus, where Teva refers to the waterproof crib that kept the infant Moses from drowning in the Nile. In both cases, if you think about it, a fragile boat sailing on dangerous waters keeps safe a savior of the people. So that's common to both. And that, the readers of the Moses story, therefore, and I think readers of the um, flood story, could see the divine will that was continually at work, in this case, saving Noah, uh, saving uh, Moses uh, in order to save the people later on. An example of cross-referencing within the Old and New Testament is the fourth gospel's use of personified wisdom from Proverbs 1 to 9, which it uses to interpret the person and work of Jesus. This, I think, is familiar to us. The Gospel of John underlies, underlines Jesus' heavenly origin by seeing him as personified wisdom. As woman wisdom was with God from the beginning, even before the creation of the world, so Jesus is the word from the beginning, with the, Father be, with the beginning and also with the Father before the world existed. Like woman wisdom in Proverbs, Jesus speaks in long discourses. Wisdom invites people to a rich banquet where, the food, where food and drink symbolize life and closeness to God, and Jesus says the same, and I am the bread of life. As wisdom seeks friends, so Jesus seeks disciples. So that's a fairly obvious one and often used. Now interpreting each uh, testament as a self-enclosed silo thus goes against the dynamism of the Bible. Christians read the scriptures, the high graphi, as a story moving ever forward, a narrative with a culmination that lies in the future, and they read the New Testament as a culmination of that story. To put matters in a homey way, uh, we read books, I think, all of us, beginning at chapter one, not chapter six. Why not, therefore, begin the, your Bible reading with the book of Genesis rather than the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, <clears throat> so the last, the last point that I would like to make is a way through the Christian Bible, three Exodus moments. Now, does the Christian Bible itself tell us that it is a single book? I believe that it does, and chiefly through the Bible's persistent reference to origins, the origins both of Israel and of the world. We moderns, with our habitual assumption of evolution and our focus on development, tend to regard the present as ultimately de decisive. For us, beginnings are small things, often not attracting much notice until they develop and become more complex, and they move within our own time frame. To the writers of the Bible, however, the originating moment was paramount, for it was then that the hand of the creator gods was most visible, and thus the purpose of things clearest. These general remarks that I just made, I think are important for properly understanding a series of events in the Pentateuch described there. Comprehending the this, the series of events, uh, the, Hab the Hebrews' flight from Egypt, their covenant with the Lord at Mount Sinai mediated by Moses, and their journey to Canaan, the promised land. These multiple events can be, whoops, sorry, can be summed up in a single word, the Exodus. Close examination of the biblical, a biblical account of the Exodus reveals two aspects, closely connected, yet separable for analysis. The first was liberation from a dictator, the Pharaoh, who claimed divine status by demanding the Hebrew service. And her service in, the he in Hebrew has the same meaning as service in English. It means both service and it means uh, religious service. The second aspect of the Exodus that can be isolated was formation. That is, an intervention by the Lord that made a people no longer a family equipped with those features that made a people in antiquity. 
a god and a god's house, a leader, a land, and narrative and legal traditions providing the people's identity. In a sense, the Exodus is the main event of all five books of the Pentateuch. The book of Genesis is the story of the nations and of God's choosing Abraham's family from those nations. The book of Exodus describes how a family became a people by emerging from the Pharaoh's control and going to Sinai and from there to Canaan. The books of Leviticus and Numbers continue the establishment of the people and their journey to their own territory. The book of Deuteronomy gives Moses speeches to Israel and about to, about to enter its promised land. In short, the Pentateuch tells Israel who they are and how they are to live as the Lord's people. No wonder Jewish tradition today refers to it as the Torah, authoritative instruction enabling the nation to flourish. The exodus to which I am referring took place in the 13th century according to scholarly consensus. Though I need to say that some recent scholarship is inclined to locate the action of freedom and liberation in Canaan as well as in Egypt. The main elements of the Exodus consisted in liberation from oppression, from oppressive Egyptian rule, remembering the God of the Father under his name Yahweh, the Lord, entering into a covenant with the God who had liberated them and <clears throat> becoming the Lord's people by acquiring what was needed for peoplehood in that time. Though recent archaeological research offers refinement to the biblical account, I will focus on the account we have in the Bible, which is, of course, an interpretation of what happened, no less than modern interpretations. We need to remember that historical accounts of the Exodus and the Pentateuch and elsewhere in the Bible do not conform to modern standards of history writing and are characterized by other interests, such as displaying interest in displaying the divine glory and human response, which you can call doxological, and also assuming that the Lord's activity was discernible in their own and in their nation's history. Later Israel, on reflection, uh, reflecting on the biblical account, found three characteristics of the original ex exodus especially meaningful. They found the liberation part important, the covenant, and the multiple blessings. Liberation is the starting point of the, exit, of the first exodus, as I mentioned. The hitherto silent God Abraham of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saw his people on the verge of extinction, incapable of hope and prayer, and expressing his superiority, and then went on to express his superiority in the plagues, freeing them from the yoke of the Pharaoh who had appointed himself their God. Liberation from a false power, a God, henceforth became an inseparable component of Exodus. A second feature of the Exodus that attracted later, attentions, later attention by later generations was the covenant, the legal agreement that the Lord and the people entered into at Sinai after their escape from Egypt. Accepting the Lord's invitation to become his people, the people heard his Ten Commandments and the laws that defined that relationship mediated by Moses. In the ratification of the, of the covenant, Moses set up an altar and 12 pillars symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. He sprinkled blood on the altar, which represented God, and then on the people, thus establishing kinship between God and people. Then Moses and the 70 elders of Israel ascended the mountain to share a meal with the heavenly sheikh, whose hosting of them constituted his acceptance of Israel into kinship and covenant. The third feature that future generations saw as meaningful from the original uh, Exodus was the blessing that came, the, many of the blessings that came with the people's acceptance. Now the Psalms can constantly celebrate the Exodus, often referring, it, uh, referring only to a single episode like the waters of Meribah. The prophets of the eighth to the sixth centuries refer to it to console Israel with its promises of divine presence and protection and to indict Israel for failing to live up to its demands. The Exodus, in short, became the national story, repeated in its entirety or in part, with the purpose of reminding Israel where they came from, who they were, and how they must live in their relationship to God. So powerful was the story of the Exodus that it became for later generations a lens for interpreting other major saving events. It invites us today to view the entire Christian Bible as three Exodus moments, each moment requiring the people's action. The first Exodus moment I just referred to, the 13th century BC event narrated in the book of Exodus. The second Exodus moment 
which we call Exodus II, is the 6th century BC return from the Babylonian exile that the prophets interpreted as a new exodus. The third exodus moment is the life and ministry of Jesus culminating in his death and resurrection and interpreted in the New Testament as another new exodus. Indeed, the exodus par excellence, as Christians see it, the climax of God's saving action. Let me say a word about each of those two later reenactments, so to speak, of the first exodus. Exodus two and three, Exodus two and three. In August 4, 586, there occurred an event in Israel's history so devastating that many people thought it meant the end of Israel. The Babylonians destroyed the Lord's house, the Lord's city, and the anointed king. To onlookers, it seemed to mean, or it could mean, that Israel's God, the Lord Yahweh, had been dethroned by the gods of the Babylonians. The prophets, however, thought otherwise and preached a new exodus. Jeremiah saw a new Sinai covenant that will not be broken because God will strengthen the people's hearts. For Ezekiel, the future exodus was a purifying judgment in the wilderness, after which the people will be given hearts of flesh to replace their hearts of stone. The great prophet of the new, of the new exodus, however, was second Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55 of that book, who preached that Israel this time was to go from Babylon to Zion rather than from Egypt to Canaan. The desert rather than the sea was to, is to be turned to, ter, tamed by roads over which the Lord will lead his people. The servant of the Lord who announced and led the trek across the wilderness has many traits of Moses. In sum, the message of second Isaiah was, depart from Babylon, as Israel of old once fled from the land of Egypt. <clears throat> now to Christians, the culmination of the Exodus moments is Jesus' ministry that is recorded for us in the New Testament. <clears throat> At the time, the view of many, of many Jews, uh, a minority, but uh, many Jews, was that a new intervention was about to take place. That was the time of Jesus. They expected a new Exodus that would end the Roman Empire's rule and renew Israel. <clears throat> the expectus, the expectation is the setting for the New Testament. Jesus saw the coming judgment of God as more than a renewal of Israel. It was a decisive turning point in God's relationship to Israel. He saw it, in a word, as a new exodus. That is why he chose the 12, notice the, the uh, recalling the 12 tribes of Israel, and why he, like Moses, fed the people in the wilderness and established a new covenant that fulfilled the old one. Each of the evangelists then, in their own way, highlights the Exodus themes and motifs in the presentation of Jesus. For example, in the opening chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew portrays Jesus as a new Moses. Jesus as an infant escapes the slaughter of Herod. He returns with his family from Egypt. He passes through the waters at his baptism. He is tested in the wilderness for 40 days, and he ascends the mountain to give God's law, though like Moses, Jesus does not say, thus says the Lord, but rather, I say to you. Similarly, John, the Gospel of John, presents Jesus via a reinterpretation of the Exodus. Jesus is both, both the new bread from heaven and the Paschal lamb. At the crucifixion, water flows from Jesus' side, recalling the water from the rock in Exodus 17. And those who look on the crucified one receive healing, evoking the, the mounted bronze serpent, uh, serpent in Numbers 21. Exodus 3, the New Testament occurrence of it, has the same two major aspects that characterized Exodus 1, liberation and formation. Thus, for instance, Mark emphasizes exorcisms as a central feature of Jesus' healing ministry and describes him as liberating his people from demonic powers. In the Pauline writings, liberation consists of redemption from the enslaving power of sin and in dethroning the powers and principalities that were believed to be ruling the world. The formative aspect of Exodus can be found in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, where Jesus takes on the mantle of the new Moses. And Paul suggests the formative aspect in 2 Corinthians 3, where he describes the work of the Spirit in empowering its recipients to take on the likeness of Christ. Luke and Paul, when relating Jesus' words uh, over the wine at the Last Supper, develop their understanding of covenant from both the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 and the covenant ceremony described in Exodus 19 to 24. Note the dramatic reinterpretation of Jesus' own blood, not an animal's blood, establishes 
the, that reinterpretation establishes a close, close bond between God and people. The torn bread that Jesus uh, uses in the Last Supper symbolizes his flesh torn in the Passion. So Jean, Jesus was seen, therefore, as bringing the journey to its proper conclusion. The New Testament is also replete with allusions to the Isaiah servant in connection with Jesus. This association likely stemmed from Jesus himself when he summarized his ministry in these words, for the Son of Man name came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Words that are taken from the fourth servant song, Isaiah 53. The, the Isaiah servant songs, in short, were particularly important for interpreting the suffering and death of Jesus as salvific and liberating. Now, as I was writing this talk, I could not help reflecting on the relationship between early Judaism and emerging Christianity. As was well known, Phariseeism was one of the three groupings of Palestinian Judaism mentioned by Josephus, and it became a tributary, a major tributary, to second century rabbinic Judaism. Now, neither Phariseeism nor Ju rabbinic Judaism accepted Jesus' and his followers' apocalyptic reading of the ancient scriptures. The differences then, therefore, in a sense, between the Jesus movement and mainstream Judaism were to a large degree determined by the books of scripture that each privileged. Jesus and his followers, plus other, some other first century Jewish sectarians, preferred to read their favorite books, Psalms, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah, with an eye on the immediate enactment of the events these books spoke of. Pharisaic Judaism, on the other hand, read their scriptures differently in a non-apocalyptic way. One can thus say that rabbinic Judaism, from which contemporary Judaism has developed, and Christianity are related as siblings rather than as parent-child, and both derive from Jewish groups that diverged more or less at the same time. And so I would, my last word would be, the task of both Judaism and Christianity, therefore, is to live as siblings, brothers and sisters, sharing their scriptures and learning from each other. Thank you. I think Father Clifford stated well that religious thinkers in the ancient Near East paid careful attention to the continuous further unfolding of ancestral traditions. By the way, in an earlier version of Father Clifford's talk, he used the phrase further unfolding several times and then changed it to development in his final edition. But I didn't know that until I heard him give the talk. So I'm using the phrase further unfolding quite a bit. <laughs> religious thinkers in the ancient Near East paid careful attention to the continuous further unfolding of their ancestral traditions. One can see this outside of Israel, including in, say, the royal ideology of Mesopotamia. The deeds of ancient kings provide a pattern of kingship to which later dynasties attempted to conform. Historical records provided points of reference for later generations, and for later generations to use to judge their own effectiveness. Adaptation to ever-changing conditions unfolded according to a strategy of rereading and replicating the deeds of heroic ancestors in contemporary circumstances. As Professor Clifford demonstrated, this strategy of relecture, the term literary critics use for the process that generates discrete receptions of a primary reference text, is what ancient peoples in Israel and the ancient Near East used to employ their historical texts as a guide to the present. Each return to an ancient reference text contains the potential for a new reading. The reader's unique questions and circumstances result in discovery, a discovery of new meaning, often beyond the intents of the original author. Relecture is a process in which an ancient source continues to unfold its message long after the interests of the original composers and audience are exhausted. As Professor Clifford showed, the Exodus narrative was especially the focus of relecture. Its three most significant elements, liberation, covenantal nation formation, and blessing, become individually and together touchstones of religious art 
as we see in the Psalms, and touchstones of socio-cultural integrity, as we see in the works of the prophets. The Exodus narrative provided a narrative schema by which later Israelites were able to find meaning in their own experience. The post-exilic generation, as we heard, saw the return from Babylon as a new exodus. I might add another example. The warriors who liberated Israel from Greek rule saw in the name of their movement a reference to the exodus. Maccabee might come from the Aramaic word hammer, as we all learn in our historical critical classes, but it is also an acronym of the Hebrew words of Exodus 1511. Mi kamoka be'elim Adonai. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? This is a line from the ancient poem that Israel sang after the crossing of the Red Sea. Thus, in their very name, the Maccabees laid hold for themselves the significance of the Exodus. But the further unfolding of ancestral traditions was not merely an intellectual act. Israelite relecture contained a strategy of reenactment as well. The Babylonian exiles actually moved back to Israel. The Maccabees actually fought and won. Early Christians crafted communities that prescinded so radically from the surrounding culture that even an emperor hostile to the faith had to acknowledge Christians feed all their own poor and ours as well. Rereading required reenactment. The Exodus was not a proposition to be understood but a reality to be lived out, and its meaning unfolded only when it was performed in everyday life. Christian thought benefits immensely from an awareness of its root in biblical tradition. I have noted with happiness how Pope Francis often draws on these biblical roots, especially the Old Testament roots, in his ongoing discussion of disciples on mission. In in his exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, Working within the world of the biblical text, he offers his own relecture of a believer's divine mission. His primary reference is God's command to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, go forth from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. He identifies an important reception text to appear in Exodus 3.10 when God tells Moses, now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Pope Francis identifies another reception in Jeremiah 1.7 when the Lord tells the prophet, To all whom I send you, you shall go. And he identifies the primary Christian reception of this text to appear in Jesus' sending of the apostles on mission and in Luke's gospel, the parallel account where Jesus sends the 72 disciples on mission. Pope Francis uses this reading and relecture to exhort Christians to reread the Abraham story in the context of their own lives and to see their lives as a mission no less compelling as the mission Abraham went on. As Marcion heresy and other movements like it have exposed, the temptation always exists for Christians to make of Jesus a new primary reference, instead of recognizing that his gospel is a reception of earlier Israelite reference texts. Certainly for Christians, it's a privileged reception, but nonetheless, it formed in a context of the Hebrew Bible. Giving in to this temptation can easily lead Christians into a false direction. Take, for example, Matthew 8.20. One of the scribes came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Reading this passage in a first century Greco-Roman context, it would be easy to call Jesus a proponent of some kind of radical indifference to material comfort in the manner of a Stoic or Cynic philosopher. To read it in this way without the benefit of the Hebrew scriptures would obscure the relecture that is actually at work in the text. A Christian who reads this text in the context of Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah hears something that Jesus doesn't actually say. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head because he is sent out on mission. 
an awareness that Jesus' words unfold in the tradition of Abraham helps the reader recognize the portentousness of the expression. Jesus' homeless wandering reenacts the similar circumstances of Israelite heroes of old. This strategy of relecture and reenactment continues today. Christians turn to the Old Testament as the primary reference for traditions of faith. They conform their lives to the example of Christ, who himself was reenacting the history of Israel. Only in the context of this unfolding tradition, rooted in the Hebrew scriptures, can the true meaning of our Christian gospel be understood. So I'm going to propose a question uh, both to Father Clifford and to all of you. What are the dangers and what are the values, what are the complications of reading the gospel in the context of the Hebrew scriptures, reading the, the two testaments of scripture as one? Certainly, we can watch as you know, great theologians do it. Um, but for ourselves, for people who read the scriptures with, with an eye toward prayer or, or faith, this can sometimes become a complicated affair. Um, I, would, I would ask Father Clifford and, and all of you, what, what have you discovered as, as a surprise and as a joy, but also what have been the complications of doing that? Well, I talked about the joys of it, so I'll begin with that. I think uh, it just gives, I think you gave it a good example in... Uh, the uh, Son of Man has no way to lay his head as an example of uh, reading uh, more than, reading, seeing more in the words than might first appear because of your knowledge of the scriptures and your awareness that they are uh, re-reading uh, the, the ancient scriptures. Uh, the, uh, the dangers, I, I, I see, few, few, I'm in that field, so I don't see many dangers there, but <laughs> probably some of those people do. Uh, I think maybe to, to denigrate the value and the novelty of the New Testament text by overemphasizing the, um, uh, the, the uh, resonance with the uh, Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, perhaps that might be one. <clears throat> but I think uh, the issue today, though, I think is trying to uh, uh, read the New Testament as, a, as you said so well, a reception of an ancient tradition that is uh, enriching it, and re but receiving it, though, and, and enriching it at the same time. So I guess uh, that's how I would see that. The, you might, uh, people in the, in the uh, audience might have other points of view on that. And before we uh, allow people a uh, chance to ask questions, I'm going to uh, take control of the mic for a second and ask Dick a question that I've always wanted to ask him is it's no it's it's a simple question and it comes from my experience and, and those in uh, ministry of the word I'm sure you've had this uh, happen to you before the person who comes to you after mass making a comment in the homily good or bad but maybe just reflecting the readings I love the God of Jesus it's so easy for me to relate to God of Jesus and I find the God of the Old Testament so harsh now you have 10 or 15 seconds right <laughs> Well, I what, what response do you okay. give it? Well, I, the, uh, the, the alleged harshness of God in the, in the uh, Old Testament Hebrew Bible is uh, there are obvious places where God is extremely harsh and uh, where, where uh, there's punishment uh, inflicted by God. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but there are passages that we often overlook in which the issue really is passion of God. Uh, uh, that it's not... It's anger, but the anger comes from uh, ex dashed expectations and a prior relationship of deep and complete commitment by the Lord to his people. And it's the anger of a parent. Uh, now, there are, some, there are some passages that are really pretty severe. But uh, the, uh, the love part, the, the, but the, then people don't understand that Jesus is quarreling with many of his people all the way through the Gospels. <laughs> And he does not mince words, as in Matthew 23. He's not exactly 
the gentle savior there. There's a, there's a, there's a real difference between himself and some of, his, some of the religious leaders of the time, and he doesn't mince words. He also says, as I like to say, uh, when he tell, in, in the Gospel of John in the, in the last discourse, when he, which is so gentle and so reassuring, but he also says, don't be afraid. I've, over, I've, I've beaten the world. I've, I'm victorious over the world. So that there's a, there's a conflict even within the New Testament that has to be recognized. That the New Testament does not, it's not simply an affirmation of where people are. It's both an invitation to them, but it's also a challenge to them to adjust their behavior uh, in the light of what Jesus thinks is happening in the world, what, he, what, he, what he's announcing is happening in the world. So it's, it's, it's a both end sort of thing, but I think people should also recognize. There's some beautiful passages, say in Hosea chapter 11, I don't think you can get a better passage in which uh, the Lord demands that Israel convert, and then when he sees that it's not going to happen, announces that he will convert, <laughs> because he can't, as he says, I am God, I am God, not, not a human being. So I can do it, uh, and if you can't convert, I'll try to I'll convert to you because I want to be with you with such, with such uh, vehemence and passion. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. I uh, I was not checking my email there. I was looking for the readings from yesterday's gospel. Um, if if any of you had the opportunity to read them or to attend mass yesterday, Jesus talks about how when when the end time comes. You know, many will receive the harshest possible beatings, but some will only receive a light beating. Um, and I, I think, you know, and this is from Luke's gospel, right? This is not from the gospel that we usually think of as, like, particularly judgmental. Um, I, I usually try to tell people in those 15 seconds that the, the distinction between the harsh God of the Old Testament and the loving God of the New Testament is vastly overrated. Um, that actually both Testaments speak with a pretty similar voice on the nature of God. And uh, you should read the fullness of both texts before responding. Thank you. Uh, because Michael and Dick were uh, very disciplined in their time, use of time, we still have a half an hour for uh, questions or comments to emerge uh, from you. What we'd ask you to do is indicate your desire to do so and wait until one of our uh, students brings you the microphone. John has always been a troublemaker. <laughs> it's nice to be back in your classroom again. <laughs> uh, can these three historic events that you speak of, liberation, covenant, and blessings, can these events be used to understand other aspects of the church's life, such as the life of the church, or the, or the life of moral development, or of the life of just growing in holiness? Yeah, I think they do, and that, thanks for the question because it's a good question. I think that uh, I've always, I've, I have found that uh, the, new, the, the Exodus is very profound in its understanding of commitment and allegiance. That in a sense, it's saying you really can't commit yourself to God wholly unless you disenthrall yourself of other allegiances. And uh, what is, I think, uh, remarkable about the depiction of uh, the the, pl the so-called plagues, which I think should be called rather demonstrations of divine power to convince the Pharaoh to let the people serve the right God, uh, is that the Pharaoh, rep the Pharaoh has exalted himself and raised himself to the level of a deity, and that the purpose of the plagues is to help the Pharaoh recognize this is delusion, that he's not a god at all, and that he's demanding of the people, the Hebrews, the poor, afflicted Hebrews, what nobody has a, chance, has a right to demand, their allegiance. And so I think what it, what, in terms of spirituality and personal commitment, I think it tells us that uh, the, uh, the movement toward God is, is, involves a movement away from other pseudo-gods. So that's there. The other thing that I think is helpful is to say the formation of the people involves the revelation of God not only uh, God's commands, but God personally. And one of the great achievements of the Second Vatican Council regarding Revelation, because it, it has to be seen as a continuum with what was said about divine word in Trent and in Vatican I, was to emphasize the personal, the self-communication that is at the heart of Revelation. That the first thing that is communicated is God's presence and love and acceptance. And then there comes, though, 
instructions on how best to live out that uh, human response to God's initiative. Could, could I just hear your question again? I I think certainly, um, I, speaking for myself, I, I wouldn't necessarily find those three universally applicable, but moments of great healing and great transition in, in all of our lives, I think, um, have a certain resonance with the Exodus. I, I, I suspect that everyone here is, has probably gone through, maybe I'm overstating the case, many of us have probably gone through periods in our life, unexpected transitions in our life when we just had to be solely in the care of God. And in, in those moments, I mean, I, I think it's common to speak of those as a desert experience. And that is a phrase that comes right out of the Exodus narrative, for example. Um, so certainly, I, I think, you know, uh, using the language of Irenaeus, recapitulating in our own lives, the summing up in our own lives through Christ, the, the events of the Exodus, and, and specifically of those three touchstones of the Exodus, I think would be a, a common, even almost like subconscious thing that a lot of Christians would do. Enrique, you something. Enrique, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, let's get the microphone here so we can pick you up. Uh, thank you, Dick. Uh, I was very happy to listen to your presentation. And it, was, it was a pleasure and a privilege. Um, I like very much your point on the Exodus, uh, how it is uh, uh, presented in three moments, and you talk about uh, liberation, covenant, and blessing. Um, by the way, I look forward, I can't wait to read your forthcoming book on the three Exodus. Uh, so. Just wait till it's written. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, now, if I look at the New Testament, um, uh, there is one moment uh, in the gospel tradition, very important. Uh, it is the gift of the Spirit. All the evangelists look forward to that moment. That is going to be like the culmination of the work of Jesus. Uh, can we find that element? Uh, that is a, a, a major, most important event in the New Testament, the gift of the Spirit. What about the Old Testament? Ezekiel speaks about uh, uh, God uh, giving his spirit. But uh, besides Ezekiel, can we really speak that also the gift of the spirit could be a major moment in the uh, Old Testament? You mentioned, uh, as I said, uh, um, uh, liberation, covenant, and blessing. But Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, it seems that he parallels, he understands the blessing of Abraham with the gift of the Spirit. Uh, so perhaps that could be one possible way of uh, dealing with that, uh, to see in the idea of blessing a correlation with the gift of the Spirit. But anyway, these are some thoughts, so I don't know if you have some uh, ideas. Thank you. Uh, yes. The, uh, the Spirit in the, book, in the book of Exodus does not play a major role. It, 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 they don't use it. But where the Spirit comes in, importantly, is in the second, Exodus 2, if you want to say it. It's uh, one of the uh, things that happened during the exile, it seems, is that people look forward to the future with some foreboding. Even some of the prophets who uh, hoped for a, a renewal and a revival and a, and a return. And the reason that they did was they thought that eventually Israel would fall into the same problems and the same sins that had brought on the first uh, exile. And one uh, and three of the prophets uh, dealt with that, uh, I should say two of the prophets anyway, Isaiah does in his own way, uh, by saying that in the new age, when things, when, when we have a new covenant and so on, there will be a spirit given to you that will renew your heart so that you won't fall into the same pattern of disobedience that had brought your ancestors into 
uh, into the situation that they found themselves. And uh, as, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 is really the best expression, 31 to 31, which was mined by New Testament authors, because it talks about giving you a new covenant that is going to be in, written in your hearts, and you won't have to teach your children because it will be inherent. It'll be, it'll be uh, given to you within. Then Ezekiel in chapter 36 talks about God giving the people a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. And then I think, though, that the one, the text that I think uh, puts this thing very succinctly, and my guess is it may have been written about that same time, but I have no idea about dating of the, some of the Psalms, uh, is Psalm 51. Because Psalm 51 proceeds in a kind of two-panel uh, approach, which is not unusual in some of the Psalms. In the first part of the psalm asks God to forgive my sin. And uh, there are various images for forgiveness there, turning away, God don't look at my record book, uh, God wash me, there's a variety of ways. But it's really, remo it's really removing the sin from me. But the second part of the psalm, beginning I think in verse 11 or so, then talks about uh, the Lord renewing my interior and giving me your Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit doesn't, it doesn't occur very often. It takes, I think, two or three times in the, in the Old Testament. And it talks about giving me a new, a new interior life that will, make it, uh, that will make it easy for me to adhere to your commandments in the future. So there's a kind of interior renewal. I think those are attempts to deal with this question of it's going to happen, the same thing's going to happen to me as happened to me in the past. What I think Paul does, and I've talked about it with my Pauline expert with whom I teach a course, and he's, I don't want to say he's in agreement, he seems to be in agreement, <laughs> uh, is that Paul took that, took that, uh, those texts and similar texts very seriously and uh, spoke of the renewal of the heart and the spirit that would take place in his new age, uh, using, uh, developing uh, statements and assertions made by the prophets regarding this very point. And that I think that's one of the sources of the New Testament emphasis on the Spirit, because you don't get that same emphasis uh, and single-mindedness in the Old Testament, except for some texts, but those texts that I mentioned are the ones that you, I think, uh, find it most uh, vividly. <clears throat> if, if I may, uh, I do agree with Dick. Uh, Great minds think alike. My father also reminds us that uh, mediocre minds think alike. So I'm not sure <laughs> if we're dealing, but we're, we're in agreement. But uh, one text that would show that is 2 Corinthians 3, look in verses 3 to 6. You're just going to see that imagery evoked from Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31 and, and in the context of New Covenant ministry. But I would add to it what the spirit, the, the role of the spirit uh, in the New Testament, how that fits into the Exodus uh, motif is it's the spirit that forms the people. It's the spirit that not only forms and uh, teaches, but also empowers the way of life. Uh, so, you know, when Paul exhorts to walk, conduct oneself in the way of spirit, he's talking about formation of, of a people and conducting oneself. So I, I think the spirit actually works very nicely within this, uh, within this framework. Yeah, I, should, I should add finally that the, in the Book of Wisdom, which is in the Catholic and the Orthodox canon, emphasizes strongly uh, wisdom and spirit. In fact, it seems to, in some, time, in some ways, uh, describe the action of wisdom as the spirit. And uh, you can't get a more exalted sense of wisdom entering into the very uh, center of a human being's life than you get, than you get in, the, in the middle part of the Book of Wisdom. Uh, it's just extraordinary. And I think that it, it really sets the stage for new, new what Paul says about is, no, is, is, in a sense, continuing that uh, extreme, uh, well, not, it's not extreme, Ex that, em that unusual emphasis upon the spirit in the Book of Wisdom. Yes, we have a question here. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Could you talk a little bit about how the uh, Jewish uh, rabbis think about the Exodus experience in terms of the current history? And what I'm thinking of is growing out of World War II with the oppression, uh, the liberation, the establishment of the state of Israel, do they interpret this as a new exodus? Uh, and what does that mean in terms of how we think of it in terms of Christians as they're being our brothers? 
I have to say, I really, I'm, not a, I'm not familiar enough with Jewish uh, current theology and, and religious uh, thinking to be able to answer that in any depth, but I, uh, I'd refer you to people like Michael Walser and other, peop other Jewish uh, scholars who have worked on it. Uh, I can't, I, I'm assuming that that does have an important uh, part, that, that does form an important part of their thinking about uh, what happened after World War II and the possibilities for renewal and growth. But I, I have to say I, I really don't know enough to answer your question in any depth. I know, I know a little. Um, again, I would refer you to the, the sources that, that Father Clifford suggested. But my, uh, my, my initial response would be no, and here's why. Um, the State of Israel was founded originally by secular Jews who, who were trying to move away from what they thought of as kind of like the closed religious environment of Eastern Europe that, that they thought was part of the problem that Jews faced there. And they wanted a modern secular nation state, um, kind of like the ones in the West. So, so at least for the initial Zionists that created Israel, I don't know that reenacting the Exodus was, was itself an important motivation. Now, poetically, it's, it's definitely there in, in some of the early literature. But I don't know if it was a religious motivation. Um, I, I also know from, because I've, I've had the opportunity to visit and work in Israel a bit, um, among my Jewish friends there, I know that the more religious Jews there tend to shy away from the human efforts to create a state of Israel as, as a, a sign of divine action. Um, they, the, the, even the very religious Jews living in Israel, many of them are still waiting for God to act on Israel's behalf. Um, now, is there a Zionist rabbi out there who is, you know, preaching that this is the new exodus? Uh, probably. But um, I don't, based on what little I know, um, I don't get the sense that that is a widespread motif driving the development of Zionism and, and driving patriotism in the state of Israel today. We have a question back there, and then Rick. Yeah. Brief reference was made to Pope Francis and, and some theme that he would draw from Scripture. You may not agree with me, but Francis seems to be moving toward a better appreciation of the laity grappling with a lot of issues in the church and trusting their instincts. I'm curious if any of the panelists would comment and what you think is the main influence uh, from the Bible that, that helps Francis to shape that view of church? Uh, I think he certainly, the, um, one of the things that he's interested in is, is the uh, being very authentic with relationship to God and uh, that comes out of what he considered, from his understanding of Jesus and his, uh, his relationship to uh, the Father and to his disciples. But I'm not sure there's anything uh, that specific. I can't think of anything. I mean, the, his, his, uh, his, his encyclical on the environment clearly owes much to Genesis and an understanding of the air. But I'm not sure if there's any particular text that I can think of that uh, would answer your question to, uh, in the way that you might want it answered. I, I don't know. My, my gut response is that he is listening to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, who is probably presenting the, the scriptural sections of the encyclicals and the apostolic exhortations that he's writing. But that's, that kind of begs the question. Um, I think he definitely seems to, to be the beneficiary of, of a, a very good you know, post-Vatican II appreciation for background, for the way things were expressed in their original context. Um, and I would also say for, for an idea that these ideas developed over a long period of time before they, they took their final form in the Bible that we have today. The previous two popes also had, had the benefit of this. Um, I think that the pope, this particular pope, is very interested in, at least on, based on the, the writings I've read, he's interested in, in finding ways that individuals can insert themselves into the ongoing unfolding of the biblical narrative. That it's, it's not a, it's not a, the revelation might be finished, but the narrative, the story isn't done. 
you know, God, God has revealed God's self completely to us, but the, the climax hasn't been reached yet. And um, I think in that, he's opening up a, a great deal of space for every Catholic, lay, clergy, religious, whatever, for every Catholic to insert him, sir, himself or herself into the ongoing biblical narrative. Does that get to what you were asking? Okay. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, maybe Father Clifford does. Yeah, I, uh, there's a uh, retired bishop, uh, auxiliary bishop I got to know here who, uh, uh, with whom I speak on occasion, and he expresses his, his candid um, difficulty understanding Pope Francis's homilies, the daily homilies that are made available. He says, where's he getting this? How, how, he, re he reads scripture in a peculiar way. And, and what I tried to explain to him, because as a Jesuit, I know exactly, at least I think I know exactly what he's doing. He's, he's, he's using, he's putting himself into the scene of the text. He's making very easy analogs with, you know, present circumstances. So in that sense, I think his Ignatian training, especially uh, Ignatius' invitation, the exercises of how to, to contemplate the scriptures, I think comes through in his homilies all the time. It's more readily apparent to me in those than in his uh, uh, constitutions and, and exhortations. But, but in, in response to your first question, I would say joy of the gospel is, is the place where I would go, where at least I'm aware of, he, he's drawing upon, I don't think he's, 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 he's drawing an ecclesiology from text itself. I think he's, he's bringing an ecclesiology into those texts and, and basically, uh, exhorting all of us that the call of Christ is to everyone and that we all have certain responsibilities and bear witness to the gospel. So, um, so I'm not sure if, if that's a satisfactory answer. I'm not sure if he's getting the ecclesiology from the text, I think, but he's bringing that understanding of church that I would say is very Vatican II into his reading of the scripture. So, uh, Rick. I've just got two brief questions. One regarding the three Exodus traditions is where or how do we understand the conquest of the promised land, the, the settlement or the resettlement of that as part of that um, unfolding of the three Exodus traditions? And the second question is there are shadowy figures that figure throughout uh, the Hebrew scriptures like the Son of Man in Ezekiel, the Suffering Servant in Isaiah, that could be individual historic people or could also be collective representations of Israel, but they're certainly compelling to both Jesus and the early Christians in terms of the work of interpretation. And I'm just wondering where is scholarship right now on those figures? There are two simple questions. There you go. Uh, the first, I, the conquest is a real issue because it seems to be that the, the sin of the Canaanites, their, their problem was that they were occupying a land and living on it peacefully, and they are conquered from without. The conception, the viewpoint of the Bible is that Israel has a right to that land because it's been given by God, and, and God has a right to assign different lands to different, different territories to different peoples. Uh, and the question of the uh, the, the uh, question of the conquest is an ongoing interpretive problem in the Bible because it seems unfair and unjust, and especially the command to exterminate the people. <clears throat> uh, the issue is we don't completely know the problem in really coming solving the problem of the issue of the conquest is we really don't know fully and completely what exactly the conquest consisted of. Uh, the tendency of many people is to say the conquest is really a, a more of a literary uh, attempt to persuade the Israelites not to uh, adopt the uh, false worship uh, of the native inhabitants or of the Canaanites. And therefore, the, the, the commands to exterminate and to annihilate and so on is really 
uh, another way of saying we don't want you to in any way imitate the uh, religion of the native inhabitants because the religion of the Lord is, has a set of different commands and perspectives. So that I can, I can but it, it, it is an issue. Uh, the other thing about the question, the Son of Man in Ezekiel really is another way of saying, uh, it's reminding Ezekiel that he is only a human being and God is God. It's kind of uh, emphasizing the difference between God and humans. Uh, the question of the servant in Isaiah is there was, there was in recent years, in recent uh, research, more or less the last few decades, has been to say that the servant I uh, in Israel is, uh, is, stands over against Israel the, as servants. The Isra Israel, the people, the servants, and the so-called, except for those four passages that uh, the so-called servant songs, but that uh, you can hold that the, there is an, the, the servant in those four servant songs is perhaps the prophet who, like Moses, can stand over against the people even as he identifies with the people. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably, the, that's the way I would take it, uh, that, it, that he, uh, as, as one uh, a truly obedient uh, person, is a true and genuine servant. And, and the servant considers himself, like Moses, to be truly obedient because he is willing to go back and embark on a new exodus. The people, however, even though they have the name servant, are in some cases not behaving as servants, and therefore the servant can, as the servant, can stand over against the other servants and tell them and indict them and to uh, exhort them. That's how I see it anyway. I think that's more or less, people are more or less, I think that's where more or less uh, the scholarship is on that. Uh, some Scott, and then I realize I haven't been looking around the podium, so I will be and, more and sensitive. Jack Miles would be good. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, as well for your talk. And I take it seriously um, the need to keep the uh, two testaments together. And so uh, I'm thinking more when I walk outside that door. And if you would walk with me out that door for a second, um, it, are there suggestions you can make to somebody? who has neither the training, uh, nor the wisdom, nor the knowledge of the testaments um, to take with me, how do I do this in my real life on a daily basis, in my prayer, when I don't have, I don't believe, the, um, the knowledge to be able to make the connections with what was going on at the time that these scriptures were written, or what's the story behind the uh, Hebrew scripture uh, that's being brought into the, into the Christian scriptures. Are, are some recommendations or suggestions that you could give? Uh, I, I don't have any except that the more you read the Bible, Tanakh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, the more, uh, and to, me, to read it in imaginative ways that this is not simply a, a, a chronicle, but the, much of it is poetry, and it takes some, the, the symbolic element is important that we should be attentive to. Uh, to read it again and again and become familiar with it, because a lot of it is is what you discover by reading the scriptures yourself. The annotated Bibles are good because they give you little hints, and, and but I think the immersion yourself into it is really important. I wanted to when I when you were giving that uh, asking that question, Scott, I I had an answer to an earlier question that I didn't answer. It so <laughs> it doesn't mean that I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Uh, but the, 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 somebody said the dangers of, the, uh, of the reading the, 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 the Bible too much as, as related. I think there is a danger because it then the Christians in the past have often uh, read the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures only as projection and as predicting. And uh, as a result, once the, once the re reality to which the Old Testament uh, event or character points, you forget about it. But I think that you have to take the scriptures themselves as uh, make, telling their own story. And it's not, only, it's not always predictive. It's, it's, the story itself has meaning, and it shouldn't be dismissed. I think that if you look at uh, the chapter in Dei Verbum on the Old Testament, it, isn't partic it, it, it expresses what people were thinking at the time. But it isn't, it isn't really a good chapter, because it emphasizes too much the predictive, and it mentioned, em emphasizes too much the messianic, and it doesn't really point you to the very drama and the events that are being described on their own 
have great value and religious meaning, both for Christians and for Jews. <clears throat> so I think that's the one, the, reading it too much as uh, in the direction of the New Testament has its own dangers. That's what I wanted to say. There's some, I don't know. The easy answer to the question is by the Paulist biblical commentary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, li I like the idea of the rereading and reinterpretation. Um, it doesn't come for free. In, in, the, in the New Testament, we see it play out as uh, debates, for example, between Jesus and the Pharisees, render to Caesar, clever answers, witticisms. You, first thing is, you don't see any of that in the Old Testament, or at least I'm not aware of a lot of it. In the Old Testament, that kind of question is, is usually uh, pretty severely dealt with. But the other thing is, you see a lot of it in uh, Talmudic Judaism, and, you know, and, and it almost, almost goes further in Christianity in terms of the interplay of debate and witticism and so on. So I wonder, um, is the question really to build a bread bridge with the Old Testament Christianity or New Testament, or is the question to build a bridge with Judaism and Christianity? But, yeah, I, I'm not sure I completely understand your, your question. Are you saying, can you use the Hebrew Scriptures as a way to, to bridge the relationships to, uh, to Judaism? I'm not, I'm not... I guess I'm trying to say the treatment of the Scriptures by Jesus in the New Testament is, in some sense, a halfway step to the treatment of the Scriptures in Talmudic Judaism where it's a subject of extended debate and inter reinterpretation. Well, I, I think that the, uh, I, one of the points that I wanted to make was that in some ways the difference between emerging Judaism and emerging, Christi emerging rabbinic Judaism and emerging Christianity was the way the text that they chose to highlight themselves and also the particular lens through which they interpreted those texts. And if you look at Qumran, but Qumran is a key sometimes to to the New Testament understanding of things, it's Jesus, is you, you see that they're looking at the, for example, Isaiah 40, chapter, verse 3, uh, in the wilderness prepare a way of the Lord. They're looking at that through an apocalyptic lens, and they're looking at that as realized now, right now. And in, from what we can tell from Pharisaic interpretation, which we can kind of backward look from uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Mishnah and other sources, that Judaism itself, the mainstream of Phariseeism, did not have such an apocalyptic perspective. They, did, they looked upon, I think they preferred to look upon the Torah and to look upon it as directing their lives and giving them life-giving instruction. And so there's a really difference uh, between the two approaches to the scriptures. And to some extent, the differences between uh, Phariseeism and uh, and and uh, and Christian emerging Christianity and I'll, I'll, I could say rabbinic is the fact that that uh, that apocalyptic outlook that think that it's happening right now something brand new is is an intervention is coming wasn't there in for Judaism and they didn't see it that way and uh, so the point that I was making is that it's 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 a sign it's in one sense you can see that as an advantage both of them revere the same scriptures but they read it differently. Uh, and it's important, and I, I would quote here the, uh, the document on the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 2003, I think it was, the Jewish people and their scriptures in the, in, the, in the Christian Bible, they would say that both readings are possible. Both are possible readings. That's a very strong statement. They would say the Jewish reading of the scriptures is possible and the Christian reading is possible. And that's, that to me is a very liberating and respectful uh, beginning of the dialogue between Judaism and Christianity, which we hope will continue. And certainly we're glad the, Christian, the Center of Jewish, Christian Jewish Learning here at BC is a great example of real progress being made there. Okay, I think we have time for one last Jack, quick question, and Jack. I just wanted to uh, make one uh, small suggestion or contribution to the question that was asked earlier uh, regarding Pope Francis and the role of the laity in interpreting scripture. If I were asked to think of a spot uh, in the Old Testament where there might be a, a kind of license uh, for that um, approach, I would think of Joshua 24, where uh, the people are called upon to ratify what God has done. And Joshua warns them that the very stones will witness against them unless they, they make the commitment. So it is as if the conquest of the land has not really happened until the people accept it in the presence of God. It's a moment very much like the one that 
that Father Clifford mentioned the ratification of the covenant at Sinai. Both of these scenes have a powerfully democratic, bottom-up uh, element uh, to them. And if that is what uh, the Pope is attempting to introduce, a more, uh, you might say, collegial or democratic uh, bottom-up approach, those would be the texts I would point to. I'd say amen to that. It's very important. The, the ratification in Gen Exodus 24, the people said yes. And the official ritual included the people's assent. And I think we can also, on the reason, by that uh, uh, inference, we can then infer that when Jesus and the last covenant, there was a covenant made and the people, and the, they had to assent to it. It isn't simply, I'm doing it for you and you're watching. It's that your very presence here as the 12 rep, uh, represent, uh, you are representing a larger community and that you have to assent to what I'm doing as well. And I think that really is a good point. It's really, it authenticates a uh, kind of valid, and I wouldn't say maybe democratization is maybe not the right word, but it authenticates the fact that there's an assent needed and an acceptance needed by the people. But I, I think that was a good way to put it. Thank you for a very rich panel. I just want to ask the audience, uh, help me with the discernment as dean. Should I bring Father Clifford back for a 50th year next year of teaching? <laughs>